Well, hello again. Now, I've been playing with this machine for probably a couple of years now, and on and off, I've dabbled with engraving. And I've put a few photographs onto various materials, and just recently I decided to start looking at the subject a little bit more seriously. Um, when I say a little bit more seriously, I didn't realise how deep I was going to have to swim. Um, I mean, you can see that I'm not exactly terrible at doing engraving. I mean, I can get a reasonable picture from a photograph. To be honest, that's done with what I suppose would call a, a scattergun approach. Yeah, I experimented a bit with a few parameters and I got a pretty reasonable result. But that doesn't mean to say I understand what was going on. And so, consequently, um, we started looking at whether or not we were getting true bitmap engraving. In other words, to get a photograph like that onto a piece of wood, you can't do that with grayscale engraving. You have to do that with something called dithered engraving, which means you have to break the photograph down into millions of little dots and burn each dot onto the surface one at a time. That sounds pretty straightforward, and you're very familiar with the technology when you look at a newspaper photograph. To try and do the same thing with a laser machine is quite a lot more complex. And I didn't realise just how complex it was until I started analysing all the sort of things that I needed to understand before I could even make a, a sensible decision about how I should go about creating a picture. I've sat down and thought about this quite a lot and as an engineer I've always been taught you have to understand a problem before you can devise a solution and in fact understanding, fully understanding the problem is 50% of the solution. So what I've done, I've written down a list of items here that I've got to investigate before I can even think about doing my next picture. Now the sort of things that we're going to have to look at are, first of all, what is the spot size of your lens? Now this particular machine here, which is my China Blue machine, has got a one and a half inch lens in it. And that little machine over there has got a two inch lens in it. Now with those two lenses, what are their theoretical sharpest spot that they can produce? The next question is, what is, the, what is the practical sharpest spot that they can produce? And the question then follows, will that spot size vary depending upon the material that we're using, the speed that we're running at, or the power that we're running at? So we've got lots of variables just getting from the theoretical spot size to the practical spot size. Well, a couple of sessions ago, we did look at the effect of the high voltage power supply has on, on engraving. And I thought that at that point in time, it was the high voltage power supply that was causing a, a grayscale effect on dithered engraving. In other words, we were putting dots down, but we were getting a grayscale effect. We're getting some three dimensionality to our engraving. Now, I'm not entirely sure that that was the one and single reason for that 3D-ness and we shall come on to that I'm sure as we work through this list of things that I've got to find out about. The next question is how does RD Works interpret a nice clean pixelated image? Does it mess with your picture? So we've got to establish whether RD Works messes with our dot pattern that we send to it. If I put a picture of a hundred dots per inch into RD Works. That's basically a hundred dots horizontally and a hundred dots vertically. Now I know that within RD Works I can ask for a different output resolution. Now I don't know whether RD Works resamples the picture and changes the picture resolution or whether it just changes the dot resolution over the existing picture. So those are the sorts of details that I want to find out about because obviously they will have a significant effect on the end result when we finally come to produce a picture. The other thing that happens is we've got 
scan lines which are going backwards and forwards. Now there are two choices, there are four choices actually, but there are two main choices that people use and that's a horizontal scan where you scan one way and you scan the other way like this. Now there is a second choice where you can do scan, return, scan, return, scan, and so your scan lines always go one way. Now if you look carefully, and I have noticed this, when you do scan, 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 you'll find that the horizontal scan going that way does not line up with the horizontal scan going that way. There is a small difference offset between the two scan directions. Now I think that offset is something that RD Works calls backlash. And I believe that there is a feature within there that allows us to adjust that backlash to get the two scan lines to line up perfectly. But that's another something that I don't know about, but I think we might be able to control. Now the other interesting question that comes into this is the dynamic range of the material that you're going to be using. When I say dynamic range, I mean the colour range of the material that you're going to be using. I mean, look, here are some experiments that I did on wood. And I think at a glance you can see that I've got light, very dark, and probably about right. Now with wood, especially a light wood like this, you can see that we've got a reasonable dynamic colour range because we go from uh, almost nothing, the colour of the wood, white, to a very dark colour here, which is not black, but it's a dark brown. So we've got lots of shades of dark brown that we can use, which will be dependent upon the power, the speed, other factors. So there's a whole new set of variables just for working with wood. A similar situation exists for lovely white card because card has gain. You can either lightly scorch it or you can go very dark, almost black. We have other materials like slate, which as you can see, has got a very poor color range. There's basically only one color in there and that's whatever color the slate turns to when you hit it with the laser. So we've only got background colour and whatever colour the laser produces on that material. So that's a very, very narrow dynamic range. Now here I've got a black tile. Now it's a glazed ceramic tile. It's not a proper um, granite or something like that stone tile, but as you can see, catch it in the light right and there's a picture there. But when you look at it straight on with no light on it, it's pretty damn useless. It's not a very good picture at all because there again is only two colours in that picture and that's the colour that happens to be caused when you fire the laser at that material or the background colour. So when it comes to doing things like acrylic you've got the same problem. There's only two colours that you can use. The background colour and whatever colour a glass or acrylic happens to laser to. Now that colour, that doesn't look very clear at all until you put it onto a black background. And when you put it onto a black background, provided you catch it in the light right, you can see that there is a picture there. But if you look at it wrongly, it's not very good at all. So you've got to choose your material fairly carefully, otherwise you're not going to get a very good result. Now hopefully by understanding how all these features work, we might be able to devise some good parameters for doing each one of these materials. I certainly don't want to carry on with my blunderbuss approach um, of just choosing some parameters and giving it a try and, you know, I've wasted a lovely piece of maple here trying to find the right colour balance, the right power, the right speed. I don't want to really have to do that. I'd like to go in with knowledge and think to myself, well, if I do this, this and this, I should get a pretty good result first time. So there's a huge amount of work that I'm going to have to work through here before I can even think about doing my next picture. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be boring. Just to make life a little bit easier for you guys, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the machine itself because you're only really interested in the results. So we should spend quite a bit of time talking about what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it, and here's the results. 
So I'm going to take the painful bit away and all you're really going to see is some interesting data. I hope. <laughs> well, we've spent enough time talking about it. Let's go and start working our way through this list. Well, here's one of the pieces of equipment I'm going to be using for this experimental work. Um, it's a little USB microscope that I bought off eBay for about £15, or $15 in fact, you can also buy them for. Um, one of the things that it has that comes with it is a little plastic film which is like a measuring graticule, so you can measure things with it. And at this moment in time, what I'm measuring are hairs. And let me just show you what's appearing on the screen. So what we have here are the graticule lines um, showing various thicknesses there and we have two hairs. One of them is a hair off of your head and the other one is um, short curly hair. If you thought all your hairs were the same thickness perhaps you ought to look again. Typically most people's hair is around about 0.06 millimeters thick. Now that does depend whether you've got thick hair or thin hair but the average is around about 0.06 and you can see between that uh, 3 thou and that 2 thou line there that the, the brown hair that runs parallel with them is neither one nor the other. The curly hair which looks fairly straight in this particular instance is not quite what it seems. Normally it's about you would think that if you measure it in the right direction it's somewhere in the region of about maybe 0.1 to 0.15 it's quite thick but if you look at that hair you'll see that it's got a twist on it towards the bottom of the screen and it's not quite what it seems it's an oval shaped hair where it's got a lot more thickness in one direction than in the other direction but I'm just putting those on the screen as an example of what we're looking for and why I'm saying that is because a one and a half inch lens has got a theoretical spot size about the size of that head hair, which is 0.075, three thousandths of an inch. And a two inch lens goes up to around about 0.004 inches, about 0.1 of a millimeter. So those bottom two lines that you can see on there represent a one and a half and a two inch lens a theoretical laser line. Now whether or not we should be able to achieve that is something we've now got to find out. I've looked at both machines with exactly the same setting conditions. I have changed the pulse to manual control and I have set the pulse length to 12 milliseconds so that I cannot put more than a certain amount of power into the dot. I've also set the power on both machines to 15% power. What I've then done is I have purposely set the focus above and below the focus point for each, each machine. So here's what a 10 millimeter gap looks like on the light blade machine. Then we've got a 9 millimeter gap. Then we've got an 8 millimeter gap in the middle of the screen and then we've got a seven millimeter gap and then a six millimeter gap. Now I think we can see clearly that seven, eight, I would say that probably eight is in the best region. It could well be seven and a half but let's settle on eight millimeters as being the focal point that I ought to be working with. That doesn't look quite round that dot but Let's turn it through 90 degrees and see whether or not it still looks oval in the horizontal direction. So as you can see it's still oval in the horizontal direction which means that this microscope has got a pixel distortion and because the measuring graticule will see exactly the same distortion it doesn't really matter because the graticule is technically correct. I'd say that's about 0.22 or 0.23. So we're already twice the theoretical. Well, let's do the same thing for the uh, China Blue machine and find out what size dot is the best size dot. 
Now I think it should be round about five millimeters, which is that one. So there's four, there's five, there's six and seven. So I don't think again we've got any doubts in our mind that that one is the right size dot. I'm trying to go from the center of the graticule line. I'd say it's somewhere in a region, if you're guessing, it's somewhere in a region of about 0.18. I've set the pulse length to as short a period as I possibly can. I can't get it on either machine to drop down below 8 milliseconds. So this is an 8 millisecond pulse and it doesn't seem to have changed the dimension of the China blue dot at all. It has stayed at about 0.18. Working from the centre of the graticule line on the left hand side I would say that that's still about 0 0.23, 0 0.24, something like that. We'll say 0.23 again. Decreasing the pulse length has not, in, has not decreased the dot size. Now I'm not going to bother to go the other way and increase the period because if I increase the period it doesn't represent anything like reality. In reality the dot is going to be much quicker than that when it's running. Well here I've increased the power from 15 to 45 percent and we've gone up to a dimension of 0.1, 0.2, 0.3 I would say that's up to a dimension of 0.4 and at 35% we're at about 0.37 and at 25% I would say that's probably about 0.33. Let's check what it's like for the China Blue machine. Do we see the same results? Three, two. That's 35% power. One, two, I'd say that's dead on three. And 25% power, I'd say that's about 0.22. So we can clearly see that power makes a huge difference to the spot size. In the case of the China Blue machine, Pushing the power up to 45%, we increased the best spot size that we could find, which was already almost twice the theoretical. We pushed it up to 4.2 times the theoretical spot size. And just to confirm that result, when we looked at the um, light blade machine with its 2 inch lens in it, the 0.23 was more than double the theoretical spot size um, but we managed to push that up to four times the theoretical spot size by the time we'd pushed the power up to 45 percent so I think on two machines we have absolutely confirmed that under ideal controlled conditions with no movement the spot size goes up with power okay now that we've done um, tests on a single dot static dot what we're going to do is test on a moving dot and to do that what I've generated is a pattern here of single pixels. I've chosen a middle of the road resolution of 100 pixels per inch. I'm going to probably start off very slowly at about 10 millimeters a second um, and then we're going to gradually increase the speed on the machine itself. So I shall probably go from 10 to 50 to 100 to maybe 200 and see what effect speed is having and I'm going to keep the power down as low as I reasonably can uh, on both machines I should be able to run at 10% power. Now we're going to select output direct to make sure we get no interference with our pattern here and the interval. Now let's just check what interval I've got that set at at the moment. So I've got my calculator here and 100 pixels per inch divide that by 25.4 which converts it to pixels per millimeter and that gives me 3.937 pixels per millimeter. So if I take a millimeter, one, and divide it by 3.937, that gives me a line pitch of 
0.254. OK. Now, as we found out before, it is quite essential that you have the correct line pitching, otherwise you could miss some of these pixels. Now, I'm going to make all these files available at the end of this series so that you can run the same tests for yourself with exactly the same files. I mean, it is a little bit tedious and difficult to build the, um, the pixel files, but there won't be any need if I provide you with both sets of information, the pixel files and the RD files that you can run directly on your machine. OK, now I did say I was go not going to bring you to the machine, but I think it's quite important that you see how the machine operates in relation to the program that I've written. So we need to look at the direction and the number of strokes that are taking place. If you remember, we've got a line of pixels, then a gap, then a line of pixels, a gap. So technically, every pixel should be going in a similar direction. I didn't see that myself. I saw every line of pixels going in opposite directions. In other words, the gaps were being jumped, which is an interesting observation. Let's see the same thing for the light blade machine. OK, well, let's take a look at the China Blue machine to start with. and. The first thing we can see is that, hang on, these are not dots. The big black dot up at the top left hand corner is the direction from which the, fa the first scan line started. So these dots are travelling left to right. And then the second line is travelling right to left. Which I said is rather puzzling because I was expecting it to scan the gaps and come back to the beginning and do all the dots in the same direction. That's what 50 millimeters a second speed looks like, 10% power. And that's what 150 millimeters a second speed looks like. Here's a summary chart of the uh, China Blue results. They're not particularly clear because I've had to cram so much into one page, but I think you can clearly see the essence of the problem here. When we run very, very slowly, we get very dark marks. And as we start running faster, so we get lighter marks. Now the interesting thing is that as we start running faster, we also get thinner lines. But of course, that's almost contrary to what we want. If we want a fairly dark picture with 10 millimeters a second at 10% power, we can get a similar sort of result at 30% power, probably 150 millimeters a second. And it's a cleaner picture. So there's all sorts of compromises that we can see on this sort of page. But of course, the biggest problem that we've got is these are not dots. None of them are dots. They're all dashes. Not only are they all dashes, the dashes are at least twice, three, sometimes four times the size of a dot, the theoretical spot size. Even down at this 30% uh, power, 300 millimeters a second, we've got dots that are probably three times longer than they are wide. So when it comes to deciding what we're going to do in a picture, we may decide that we're going to have to put in a fairly coarse resolution and do maybe three scans for every pixel. But I can see all sorts of problems with this set of results. Now, the, obviously, apart from the dynamic range that we're getting, which if you run at 10% power, then you have a very limited dynamic range, as you can see, because I couldn't get to 300 millimeters a second and burn any dots. Um, if we go to 30% power, then we get a much wider dynamic range, but we get some pretty terrible dots here at 10 millimeters a second, and it's not until we start getting up to 150 maybe even 300 millimeters a second that we start in getting if you like fairly controlled width of dots and dark enough to work with i was expecting to be honest that i was going to be working down here in these very low um, power and very low speed regions but the evidence that i'm seeing here says that i really ought to be working at middle power 
and pretty high speed. But it's a bit early to make any real suppositions at the moment. We'll just look at a similar set of data for the light blade machine. Then we'll go on to do some fairly tedious measurements of all this data. Now the first observation I can make about this data is that the dots look more like dots and they look less like maggots. When we get closer we shall find that they are still um, much longer than they are wide. Again you can see the similar dynamic range on each of the powers and something I forgot to mention on the previous set of results but you can see it on here as well is that as we go from say 30 percent if you take a look at the ends of the rows you'll see that the dots almost line up. Now bear in mind alternate rows were scanned from opposite directions. Um, when we start looking at 50 millimeters a second again they're not bad the ends more or less line up the dots line up but when you start looking at 150 you'll notice that the every other row the end dots do not line up and that gets more and more exaggerated as we get faster and faster. Now exactly the same situation existed on the China Blue machine. Although this is probably the feature that they call backlash, it's not, I don't think, mechanical backlash. I think it's something in the electronic system which is causing this problem because it is speed related and it is the same on both machines and if it was mechanical backlash it's very very unlikely to be the same on both machines. Let's just put some try and put some sort of average numbers to these. First of all let's take a look at the line thickness sorry 0.125 line thickness. Right so when we take a look at this picture we've got short pixels and we've got incredibly long pixels here and over here. So I'm going to take that one on the top line there and say that that is an average type pixel. 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, point 3. 4.3. Now I've demonstrated on the first one how I'm doing the measurement. So I'll go around and I will tediously put numbers to all these other results. <clears throat> this has been a very difficult set of data to try and make some sense of graphically. So let me try and work your way through this. First of all the mauve lines at the bottom of each one of those graphs is the theoretical spot size for the lens itself. The dotted lines are the width of the lines that the laser produces and the solid lines are the lengths of the dot or line that the laser produces. So we're not talking about dots, we're talking about sausages. Now when we look at the one and a half inch lens on the China Blue machine we can see that there are more results closer to the theoretical spot size. But if you look where those results are on the chart down the right hand side you'll see that they are 400 millimeters a second, 300 millimeters a second and 150 millimeters a second. They're all quite high speed. So the distance between any pair of the same colored lines is an indication of if you like how good the dot is. The wider that spacing the worse the dot, the more it's a sausage. Now instead of dimensions what I want to do is try and put this into some sort of perspective. With that black line you can see that the length is 0.3 and the width is about 0.1. That means that the length of the line is two dots long. When we look at the light blade machine we can clearly see that the closest that any pair of lines comes is the green lines. The separation on those green lines at about 20-22% power is little more than 0.1 of a millimetre. That sounds pretty good until you realise that the size of the dot itself is already three times bigger than the theoretical. It looks as though the best 
practical size that we can get from the light blade machine is a spot size of 0.2 compared to its theoretical 0.1. In other words, it's 100% away from where it should be. Whereas on the China Blue machine, we've got a theoretical spot size of 0.075 millimeters, and we're able to achieve 0.1, which is 25% bigger. So contrary to my earlier expectations, I would want to do my engraving work on the China Blue machine at the moment. But let's not be too hasty again. We shall refer back to these graphs again when we get the full picture. We've still got a long way to go. Well, we're about halfway down my list of 11 items and my head hurts. When I look at this picture that I put onto Perspex, it almost seems like a winning lottery ticket. How on earth did I achieve it, considering all the problems that I've found so far? I think if you've managed to stay awake or stay with me during this session, you deserve a medal. Um, it is been heavy going, and I'm certainly learning a great deal. So, thank you very much for your attention, if I've still got it, and I'll see you next time, maybe.